It's almost Christmas. Have you noticed that it's almost Christmas? We have a Christmas tree up. That is a Christian Christmas tree. In case every once in a while somebody's like, why do you have a pagan, what do they call it, a Nimrod tree or something? That, that is a Jesus Christmas tree, just so you know. No pagan symbols around here. But Christmas is on its way. Raise your hand if you have yet to buy any gifts. Okay, you still have time. My list is on the desk in the other room. So I use that joke every year. I was looking online, um, trying to get my mind around how much I had to do still for Christmas. We're doing a little remodel at my house, and uh, the house is an absolute disaster. Uh, we're, our, our bedroom is in our basement, and uh, there's somebody there actually now trying to get it fixed and uh, it's just it, it never do a remodel around Christmas time it's just, it's, that's really the message of the sermon so let's pray uh, no uh, but I, anyhow I was looking online I was like I don't know how we're going to get all this stuff done and everything we need to do and I, and I ran across this little uh, little advertisement that says that the best after Christmas sales of 2019 this was published November 15th so before Thanksgiving, the industry is already planning out and advertising to us the best after Christmas sales. So they're not trying to get you for Christmas sales. They know they've already got you for that. They're coming after you now for the after Christmas sales. Black Friday hasn't happened and the, the post Christmas sales are, are up and, and ready to go. And w when I saw it, I was discouraged because I just thought how commercialized Christmas is. That will not be the theme of this message, so don't worry if it's a like, man another, don't commercialize Christmas. But don't. Sales happen because the world knows that we are involved in a, a system that loves Christmas for all kinds of reasons. But as a pastor, I want to make sure that we love Christmas for the right reason. So I'm going to run just a little test on us to make sure that we've got our focus right as we head in. So I, I'm going to put a picture up here, and I want you to be see if you can fill in the blanks and, and guess uh, who this is, and uh, so I'm um, watch really carefully. We've got, you know, when they put the black band over somebody's eyes, so you can't tell. So it's okay if you miss it, but I just want to see if you do. So, so here it is, um, and 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 I, some of the important words are blocked out. But you tell me, for God so loved the world that He gave. And, and what's the blacked out part? Is what his his one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that's the verse that Marilyn gave the lady that she met. So so just so we're all on the same page, who is this verse about? Jesus. Yes, we got to be clear here. This, 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 Jesus is, and, and we've all seen the bumper stickers and things, Jesus is the reason for the season. We almost had a war about this a few years ago when Starbucks was saying you can't say Merry Christmas. And uh, we, we dug our trenches and wanted to make sure that everybody knew that Jesus is the reason for the season. Does anybody have one of these little bumper stickers or magnets or anything? We, we, we want to keep sure that we know that Jesus is the reason for the season. We have our verses for that, We're, the one we just looked at, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And then we have another one. We'll take a quick look at it. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And we know this. This is out of Isaiah. This was a prophetic message that Jesus was going to be coming. Uh, they didn't understand it then, but now when we go back, it's like, this seems pretty clear. For unto us a child is born and a son is given. And, and we have our, our New Testament verses that we'll use to kind of make sure we understand this. This, this isn't from Linus in the Charlie Brown special. This actual scripture, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So, Jesus, we know without any doubt about 
Jesus when we're celebrating Christmas as Christians. The rest of society, maybe not so much, but we do. And we can come back to our Isaiah verse here. Not only says a child is born and a son is given, but it says the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of, his, of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. We know this. This is not new stuff. And if at this point you're not like, Dave, we know this. You should be, because you should know this. We know that Jesus is the reason for the season. But we're making a bit of a mistake. When we go and look at the verses that I just put up, it says a child is born and a son is given. It's a gift that comes from a giver. When we go and look at John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. We know this. We are familiar with it. But when I ask anybody, what's John 3.16 about? They'll say it's about Jesus, and it's not. The subject of John 3.16 is God. Now, don't get too far off the page and go, well, I thought Jesus was God. He is. But that's theological. This verse here is telling us something that we need to know about Jesus because it's telling us about something, and this is going to sound weird for a second, something larger than Jesus, societally speaking. If I said this to you, Dad loved the neighbor so much that he gave him his car so that whenever he needed, he could drive to work instead of walk, we would not read that and say, huh, what's that verse about? That verse is about the car. That verse is about Dad and what Dad did. That statement is saying that Dad loved his neighbor so much that he gave him his car so he could get to work. John 3.16, same thing. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. We're not going to do a message on the Trinity. If you are confused right now, why is he saying this? I thought Jesus was God. Jesus is God. But in the context of what we're supposed to learn and what we're supposed to carry into Christmas, God loved the world. So why am I saying this? What happens in our Christian mentality, and much more so in the world, is Jesus gets too small. Jesus becomes a baby in a manger. Jesus becomes something that we love and adore and sing about and sing to, but we, I believe, forget that God loved you. It's a little bit easy to say Jesus loves you. I've had this conversation with person after person over the years. How come Jesus and God seem so different? How come it is that this Jesus talks about love, but God seems like an angry, grumpy dude? Misunderstanding. Not clarity on the fact that Jesus and God are the same, and that Jesus isn't just a baby in a manger. He's a in-house representative of exactly what God is. And that the message of Christmas isn't Jesus came to earth to die and later raise from the dead. The message of Christmas is God so loved the world. The message of Christmas is that God, who created everything, loves you. Now, you might be sitting there going, man, I've heard this message before. Not from me, but I think we forget that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And it sounds like, I, yeah, I've heard that before, but I'm going to ask you to pause for a minute and think. If I said to you, do you believe Jesus loves you? You would say, well, of course. But if you were honest at your base, do you believe God, the judge of the universe, loves you? You might pause. Uh, I know that Jesus loves me. 
I know Jesus and God are the same. But God the Father, does he love me? Or does he just love me through Jesus? This is sort of what it's like. If you've been a part of our church for a while and you've been around Jerry, you know Jerry loves you. Jerry loves everybody. If you think I love you, that's a little different. I'm not as nice as Jerry. I'm not as far down the road theologically or spiritually or whatever you might think. I don't know how you perceive me, but if you were ever in one of my classrooms, you definitely would have questioned whether I loved you, even though I loved my students. It's easy to believe Jesus loves you. I've met with people. I went back through my calendar and looked at the meetings that I've had with people over the last two months. And I decided to just qualify those meetings based on conversation on if I thought that person, based on our dialogue, believed God loved them. And I came out at 35% no. And that's because I can't make a, a, a judgment on some because our dialogues weren't that way. And if you're sitting there and you had a meeting with me going, that's the last meeting I had with Dave, that's fine. <laughs> Why I say it is this, I believe that the Christian church and us as Christian individuals have a crisis of faith in love, that we believe that Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, but that when we actually get in the presence of God, he's going to be a little graded by us. Ugh. I don't know about that person. They weren't really what I was expecting them to be. I do some art projects from time to time. I like to paint miniatures and do some projects of different sorts. And usually when I get done with them, I will look at them and go, eh, it's not bad, but I've seen better. I think that's how we think God thinks of us. He's pretty good, but I've meant for more. You're the only one who can answer if you think that about you. But here's what goes wrong at Christmas. We get the manger and we get the baby Jesus and it's so easy to go, oh, that, that cute little Jesus, and forget that Jesus created the universe. And to forget that Jesus is an exact representation of the heart of God who came to earth specifically to die for you, but he was sent by God to die for you. If I knew you were in trouble, let's say that you were uh, uh, in the river down in Kent and it was freezing outside and I knew you had fallen in and somehow I had this premonition of that, I might be willing to come down and throw you a rope. As a matter of fact, I would. I might be willing to come down and jump in to help you. I actually believe I would. And I hate being cold. I can't say I would be willing to send my son to take your place, to die in that river. I can't say that I would, but if I would, and you, after that event, said, man, I know Pastor Dave's son loved me. I'm not so sure it's really about Dave himself. He seems kind of harsh. He seems kind of judgmental. He killed thousands of people in the Old Testament. I'm not sure that he loves me. Look at this. This is what we should be using for our Christmas verses in terms of our own hearts and in a presentation about who is God to the church. 1 John 4, 8 to 10 starts off, there's a line lead in to this, but it's not important. It says, God is love. This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. That this is love is a two-pointed statement. It's saying backwards. I've just got through describing what love is. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live. And then it's looking forward. Not that we loved God. So while we didn't love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. 
We'll pull all the unnecessary words out of there for a second and see what this is talking about. It's talking about love, and it says, God, God, His love, He sent His, God, He loved us, His Son. It's all about God. It's not about Jesus. And you might con consider this heresy. I thought about this many times working on this sermon, that Dave is trying to diminish Jesus. Absolutely not. We need Jesus bigger because he represents absolutely God. God's heart is present in the person of Jesus Christ. So when we have a manger scene, we see the Mary and Joseph over there and, and then a little porcelain baby. It might stir our hearts a little bit. It might make us feel warm. It may cause us to think, it's such a great thing that Jesus came and died for me. And it is, but it's too small. The, see, the manger took place at the base of all of creation. All the power and majesty of God has been put into creation. Everything that we see is a reflection of the power of God. There's no love of God visible when you just look at the creation. It's there to show His power. The love of God is in the manger. The love of God is His choice to send His Son to die for you and me, and what we have to do is not get sidetracked and go, we sure are happy for that little Jesus. We should be unbelievably ecstatic that the God of all creation loves you, that His heart for you is more impassioned than my heart for my sons. I can't fathom that. And I'll be honest with you, I can't fathom that for me. If I stood up here for another hour and a half, which I won't, and told you about my sons, I wouldn't begin to begin to describe the love that I have for my sons. That's how he feels about you. He can't stop talking about you. He can't stop. He says he sings songs about you. I will never do that. But he does. He has songs that he sings about Cassie. We all probably could because we love Cassie, but nowhere near like God does. He sings songs about her and about you. He created everything. He's, if, maybe you've never had a chance to go to the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or someplace, but you've had a chance just to walk outside and see a tree and a bird and the nature that he created. And in the midst of all that, you're the pinnacle of his idea. You. And what he's not is disappointed in you. He's not sorry he made you. He's not frustrated you're not doing better. He might be wishing for you better because he has so much more for you. But he is not dark in his heart about you. He's exploding with joy about you. And so we have this verse, For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son. It continues on later in John and says, whoever follows him will never walk in darkness. Is this about Jesus? Secondary, yes. Primary, it's about God the Father that loves you more than you can ever imagine, more than you can ever experience, more than you can have in your own heart towards somebody else. He loves you, and I believe this. We don't believe it. You might be sitting there going, well, that Dave's got a problem with believing God loves him. It might be. But based on my experience with people, I find very few who can sit and say with confidence, I am loved unconditionally by the creator of the universe. Now, how do I know it? He sent his only son to die for me. The message of Christmas is the love of God not the birth of Jesus. Because when we go out and talk to people, if our message is Jesus loves you, they'll probably agree. 
Whether they believe in Jesus or not, they'll probably go, yeah, based on what you're saying and how Jesus is, they do. But if you said to them, do you believe that there's a creator of the universe that's passionate about you? Probably not. So I don't want us to say Jesus is the reason for the season. I want us to say God's love for you is the reason for the season. It is. His absolute, unequivocal, passionate, focused love for you. So this is going to seem awkward. Maybe I don't care. Raise your hand for just a second. I'm not going to call on you. Just raise your hand. And already it's probably a little uncomfortable. Raise your hand up. Just put your hand. All, well, every one of you. If you're asleep, wake up. If you're not, thank you. But it, so it's, why this is hard is because we don't like to focus on ourselves. I'm going to ask you to for just a second. So I'm going to ask you to take your hand and put it on your head. And now use your other one. No, no. Uh, but <laughs> Now close your eyes. Leave your hand there. Why I'm having you do this is my dad, when I was a kid, would walk by me once in a while, and he would stop and put his hand on my head. He wouldn't say a word. But it was when I knew he loved me. Because he wanted to be in touch with me. And so just there, with your eyes shut, and for just a second, I'm going to be quiet, and I want you to think to yourself, the God of the universe loves me. The God of the universe loves me. He knows everything I've ever done, and he loves me. He knows my hurts and my failures and my pain, and He loves me enough to send Jesus Christ to die on a cross for me. Never, ever forget that. Amen? Amen. Amen.